National Public Radio, in association with independent radio drama productions, presents one of the cases of Sherlock Holmes, with Edward Petherbridge as Sherlock Holmes and David Peart as Dr. John H. Watson. This is episode two of Silver Blades. Over a morning breakfast at Baker Street, Sherlock Holmes informs Dr. Watson that he's been called to Dartmoor to investigate the disappearance of a champion racehorse called Silver Blaze and the murder of its trainer. During the train ride to Exeter, Holmes reviews the details of the case with Watson. Silver Blaze holds a brilliant record. He has won all the important prizes of the turf for his fortunate owner. Dear Colonel Ross, me indeed. Up to the time of his disappearance, Silver Blaze was the favourite of the Wessex Cup, the betting being three to one on. Even at these short odds, enormous sums of money had been laid on him. It is obvious that there were many people who had the strongest interest in preventing Silver Blaze from being there at the fall of the flag next Tuesday. This fact was, of course, appreciated at the Colonel's training stable. Every precaution was taken to guard the favourite. John Straker, the uh, trainer who was himself a retired jockey, had always shown himself to be a zealous and honest servant. He ensured that at least one stable lad remained alert throughout the night. And now, the country roundabout is very lonely. The nearest property is, in fact, another stables, owned by Lord Backwater, a competitor, and is managed by one Silas Brown. In every other direction, the moor is a complete wilderness, inhabited only by a few gypsies. Now, on the evening of the catastrophe, the horses had been exercised and watered as usual, and the stables were locked up at nine o'clock. One of the stable lads, Ned Hunter, remained on guard. A few minutes after nine, the maid crossed the courtyard to bring him a supper of curried mutton. His only drink was water. She was about 30 yards from the stables when a man stepped out of the darkness. The stranger attempts to bribe the housemaid to deliver a written message to the stable boy, Ned. Frightened, she runs into the stable and tells Ned what has happened. Ned sprang up and rushed across the stable to unloose the dog. The girl fled back to the house, but as she ran, she looked back and saw that the stranger was still leaning against the window. A minute later, however, when Ned rushed out with the hound, the man was gone, and though Ned ran all round the buildings, he failed to find any trace of him. Did the stable lad, when he ran out with the dog, leave the door unlocked behind him? Excellent, Watson, excellent. The importance of the point struck me so forcibly that I sent a special wire to Dartmoor yesterday to clear the matter up. The boy locked the door before he left it. The window, I may add, was not large enough for a man to get through. Now, Watson, what follows? Ned sends a message to the trainer, Mr. Straker. He becomes very agitated and leaves his bed, and Mrs. Straker, despite her entreaties, for it was a very wet night, and insists on visiting the stables. In the morning, Mrs. Straker awoke at seven o'clock to find that her husband had not yet returned. She immediately set off for the stables. She found the door open, Ned in an absolute stupor, and both Silver Blaze and her husband vanished. They hoped, of course, that the trainer had gone for an early morning gallop on the prized animal. But on ascending a knoll from which all the neighboring moors were visible, they could not only see no sign of the favorite, but they perceived something which warned them they were in the presence of the tragedy. In the distance, they could see John Straker's overcoat flapping from a furze bush. They raced over to the bush and found, in a bowl-shaped depression in the moor, the dead body of the unfortunate trainer. His head had been shattered by a savage blow from some heavy weapon, and he was wounded in the thigh, where there was a long, clean cut. It was clear, however, that Straker had defended himself vigorously against his assailants, but in his right hand he held a small knife, which was clotted with blood up to the handle. In his left, he grasped a red and black silk cravat, which was recognized by the maid as having been worn on the previous evening by the stranger who had visited the stables. But where was the horse? I have no idea. Neither do I. Holmes and Watson arrive at the King's Pylon stables, where they meet Colonel Ross, the owner of Silver Plays, and Inspector Gregory from Scotland Yard. Gregory has already arrested the stranger, a man named Fitzroy Simpson, who claims he was only there to get a tip on the horse race. Holmes asks to see the contents of the late John Straker's pockets, and Inspector Gregory obliges. It's all in this box, gentlemen. 
nothing out of the ordinary, as you can see. A box of matches, tallow candle, a pipe, seal skin tobacco pouch, silver watch and chain, and some papers, five gold sovereigns, aluminium pencil case, and an ivory handled blade. And the blade is entirely inflexible. And there is an inscription which is marked Weiss and Company. Mm. This is a very singular knife. Watson, this knife is surely in your line. Here, take a look. Uh, yes. It is what we call a cataract knife. Cataract knife? Mm. Yes. A very delicate blade devised for very delicate work. A strange thing for a man to carry with him upon a rough expedition, especially as it would not shut in his pocket. Well, the tip was guarded by a disc of cork which we found beside his body. Now, his wife tells us that a knife had lain for some days upon the dressing table and that he had picked it up as he left the room. It was a poor weapon, but perhaps the best he could lay his hand on in the moment. Now, how about these papers? Well, three of them are hay dealer's receipts. And one of them is a letter from Colonel Ross. Oh. Now, this other is a milliner's account for £37.15, made out by Madame Legurier of Bond Street to William Derbyshire. Now, Mrs. Straker tells us that Derbyshire was a friend of her husband's and that occasionally his letters were addressed here. Madame Derbyshire had somewhat expensive tastes. Twenty-two guineas is rather heavy for a single costume. Then it's off to the moor to visit the hollow where the murder took place. As desolate a spot as one might wish for a murder. Hey, Watson? Indeed. This hollow would ensure concealment from any prying eyes. Right. And this bush is where you found the coat of the deceased? That's correct. Mm. There was no wind that night, I understand. No, but there was a very heavy rain. Torrential rain, sir. Never seen the light. In that case, Colonel Ross, the overcoat was not blown against the firs, but placed. Yes, sir. It was laid across the bush. You fill me with interest. I perceive that the ground has been trampled up a good deal. No doubt many feet have been here since Monday night. Yes, Mr. Holmes. The ground has not been disturbed. I took the precaution of laying a piece of matting. We all stood upon that. Excellent. And in this bag, I have one of the boots which strike a wall. One of Fitzroy Simpson's shoes and a cast-off horseshoe belonging to Silver Blaze. Yes, Inspector, you surpass yourself. If you'll be so good as to give me this vital bag, I will be back in a few moments. What's he up to, Dr. Watson? Conducting a close examination. He's got his nose so close to the mud, he looks like a bloodhound. What's he about? Smelling out clues? That could be about the size of it, Inspector. Blood out? He'll find much. Ah! What's this? What have you found? It's a match, Watson. Half burned and covered in mud. Well, I cannot think how I came to overlook it. Well, I hope there are no other things you've overlooked, sir. Uh. Do not be disconsolate, Inspector. This little match was invisible, buried in the mud. I only saw it because I was looking for it. Colonel Ross and Inspector Gregory return to King's Pyland, while Holmes and Watson follow another line of inquiry. Here's the concluding episode of Silver Blaze, with Edward Pepperbridge as the master detective. slowly across the moor. The sun was beginning to sink behind the stables of Capleton, and the long sloping plain in front of us was tinged with gold, deepening into rich ruddy brown where the faded ferns and brambles caught the evening light. But the glories of the landscape were all wasted upon my companion, who was sunk in the deepest thought. It's this way, Watson. Ah, we may leave the question of who closed on straight at the instant and confide ourselves to finding out what has become of the horse. Now, supposing that he broke away during or after the tragedy, mm -hmm. where could he have gone? The horse is a very dangerous species. If left to himself, his instincts would have been either to return to King's Pyland or go over to Capleton. 
Why should he run wild on the moor? He would surely have been seen by now. And why should gypsies kidnap him? These people always clear out when they hear of trouble, but they do not wish to be pestered by the police. They could not have to sell such a horse. They would run a great risk and get nothing by taking him. Surely that's the end. Where is he, then? I have already said that he must have gone to King's Pyland or to Capleton. He is not at King's Pyland, therefore, he is at Capleton. Let us take that as a working hypothesis and see what it is. The moor, as the inspector remarked, is very hard to drive. And if it falls away towards Cableton, and you can see from here that there is a long hollow over yonder. Oh, yes. Which must have been very wet on Monday night. If our supposition is correct, then the horse must have crossed that. And there is the point where we should look for his tracks. Come along. Ah, do you see? Do you see hoof prints? Now, let us see if my lucky horseshoe fits. Yes. Oh, now, do you see the value of imagination? It is the one quality which Gregory lacks. We imagine what might have happened, acted upon the supposition, and find ourselves justified. Let us proceed. And look, a man's track. The horse was alone before. Quite so. It was alone before. Now the horse has a master. And know what's this? Hmm? The track goes off towards King Highland. Ah, oh, very odd. Holmes, Holmes, hmm? the tracks double back. Look, they come back over here and are still headed for Capleton. One for you, what? You have saved us a long walk, which would have brought us back on our own traces. Onwards, let us follow your lead. Well, Watson, here we are. And I dare say we shall receive a welcome soon enough. Oi, you there. Clear off. We want no loiterers. We have no desire to loiter. I only wish to ask you a question. Now, there's half a crown in it for your pains. Should I be too early to see your master, Mr. Silas Brown, if I were to call at five o'clock tomorrow morning? Oh, bless you, sir. If anyone's about, he will be. For he's always the first stir in it. Uh, oh, but here he is, sir, to answer your questions for himself. You have been a great service. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, sir, no. It's as much as my place is worth to let him see me touch your money. Afterwards, if you like. I thought. What's this, Dawson? No gossiping. Go about your business. And you, what the devil do you want here? A ten minutes to talk with you, good sir. I've no time to talk with every cat about. We want no strangers here. Be off, or you may find a dog at your heel. Oh, my dear sir, I do think we should talk. Permit me a quiet word in your ear. Watson, if you'd be so good as to stand just a little further off. What? Oh, uh, yes, of course. It's a lie. It's an infernal lie. Very good. Shall we argue about it here, in public, or talk it over in your parlour? Oh, very well. Come in if you must. I shall not keep you more than a few minutes, Watson. Now, Mr. Brown, I am quite at your disposal. It was quite twenty minutes, and the reds had all faded into greys before Holmes and the trainer reappeared. Never have I seen such a change as had been brought about in Silas Brown in that short time. His face was ashy pale, beads of perspiration shone upon his brow, and his hand shook until the hunting crop wagged like a branch in the wind. His bullying, overbearing manner was all gone too, and he cringed along at my companion's side like a dog with its master. Your instructions will be done. They shall be done. There must be no mistake. Oh, no. There should be no mistake. They should be there. Should I change him first? Hmm? <laughs> no. Uh, no, I think not. <laughs> I shall write to you about it. There must be no trick. No. You can trust me, sir. You can trust me. You must see to it on the day, as if it were your own. You can rely upon me. Yes. I think I can. Well, you shall hear from me tomorrow. Good boy, sir, and thank you, sir. A more perfect compound of bully, coward, and sneak than Master Silas Brown I have seldom met with. 
He has the horse there. He tried to bluster her out of it. But I described to him so exactly what his actions had been upon that morning that he is convinced that I was watching him. <laughs> of course. You observed the peculiarly square toes in the impressions and that his own boots exactly corresponded to them. Again, of course, no subordinate would have dared to have done such a thing. I described to him how, when, according to his custom, he was the first down, he perceived a strange horse wandering over the moor. I went out to it, and his astonishment at recognizing the horse with a white forehead. He saw that chance had put in his power the only horse which could beat the one upon which he had put all his money. Then I described how his first impulse had been to lead him back to King's Highland, and that the devil had shown him how he could hide the horse until the race was over, and how he led it back and concealed it at Capleton. When I told him every detail, he gave it up, and thought only of saving his skin. But his stables had been searched. Oh, an old horse faker like him has many a dodge. But are you not afraid to leave the horse in his power now, since he has every interest in injuring it? My dear fellow, he will guard it as the apple of his eye. He knows that his only hope of mercy is to produce it safe. <laughs> well, Colonel Ross did not impress me as a man who would be likely to show much mercy. The matter does not rest with Colonel Ross. I follow my own methods and tell as much or as little as I choose. This is the advantage of being unofficial. I don't know whether you observed it, Watson, but the Colonel's manner has been just a trifle cavalier to me. I'm inclined now to have a little amusement at his expense. Say nothing to him about the horse. Oh, certainly not, without your permission. And of course, this is all quite a minor case compared with the question of who killed John Stricker. And you will now devote yourself to that. On the contrary, we both go back to London by the next train. Let us bid our host goodbye. But who? Good evening, gentlemen. I've had a very pleasant and instructive walk and charming little breath of your delightful dark moor air. But I fear we can stay no longer and must return to town by the Midnight Express. Well, so you despair of arresting the murderer of Straker? There are certain grave difficulties in the way. I have every hope, however, that your horse will start upon Tuesday and beg that you will have your jockey in readiness. Might I have a photograph of Mr. John Straker? Of course, Mr. Rollins. I have one here. <laughs> Gregory, you anticipate my wants. If I might ask you to wait here for a moment, I have a question which I should like to put to the maid. Well, <clears throat> I must say that I'm rather disappointed in our London consultant. I don't see that we're any further than when he came. <laughs> At least you have his assurance that your horse will run. Yes, I have his assurance. I should prefer to have the horse. Well, I must say, Colonel. Now, gentlemen, I am ready. The Tavistock and the train to London. I see you have a few sheep in your paddock. How remarkably observant. One of the stable lads. You want a word? Indeed, I do. Barnes, over here. Yes, sir. Mr. Holmes here would like to ask you a few questions. Good afternoon, Barnes. I want to ask you about your sheep. Have you noticed anything amiss with them, Dave? Well, sir, not a much account. But three of them have gone lame, sir. <laughs> Gregory. Let me recommend to your attention this singular epidemic among the sheep. Oh, and one other thing. Note the curious incident of the dog in the night time. The dog did nothing in the night time. But that was the curious incident. Good night, gentlemen. We shall look forward to seeing you again at the races. seen nothing of my horse. I suppose that you would know him when you saw him. <laughs> I've been on the turf for 20 years and never was asked such a question as that before. What a child would know Silver Blaze with his white forehead and his muffled off foreleg. Mm -hmm. How is the betting? Well, that's the curious part of it. You could have got 15 to 1 yesterday, but the price has become shorter and shorter until you can hardly get 3 to 1 now. Oh, somebody knows something. That is clear. Part to 4 against Silver Blaze. They're shouting the latest odds now, Holmes. Fifteen to five against Desborough. Five to four on the field. There are the numbers up. All six runners are there. All six there? Well, then my horse is running. But I don't see him. My colours haven't passed. Here he is, Colonel. He's in your black and red. Well, that's not my horse. 
That beast hasn't a white hair upon its body. What have you done, Mr. Holmes? Well, well, let us see how he gets on. Now they are nearly ready for the off. Right, come on! Oh, there they go. Capital, oh, an excellent start. There they are, coming round the curve. It's Silver Blaze! Silver Blaze! Yes, what? You have money on the table. Oh, not at all. I, I it's see. my race, anyhow. Well, I confess that I can make neither head nor tail of this. Well, but don't you think that you've kept up your mystery long enough, Mr. Holmes? Certainly, Colonel. You shall know everything. Let us go round and have a look at the horse together. You have only to wash his face and his leg in spirits of wine, and you will find he is the same old silver blaze as ever. You take my breath away. I found him in the hands of a faker and took the liberty of running him just as he was sent over. My dear sir, you've done wonders. The horse looks fit and well. It never went better in its life. I owe you a thousand apologies for having doubted your ability. You've done me a great service by recovering my horse. You'd do me a greater service still if you could lay your hands on the murderer of John Strait. I have done so. He is here. Here? Where? In my company at the present moment. Well, I quite recognize that I'm under obligations to you, Mr. Holmes, but I must regard what you've just said as either a very bad joke or an insult. I assure you that I have not associated you with the crime, Colonel. The real murderer is standing immediately beside you. Here he is. The horse! Yes, the horse. And it may lessen his guilt if I say that it was done in self-defense and that John Straker was entirely unworthy of your confidence. But there goes the bell. And as I stand to win a little on this next race, I shall defer a more lengthy explanation until a more fitting time, perhaps on our return to London. Now, Watson, there are. My money is on beer stalker. Yes, the dish. Fed to the grooms. It was the first link in my chain of reasoning. Powdered opium is by no means tasteless. The flavor is not disagreeable, but it is perceptible. Were it mixed with any ordinary dish, the eater would undoubtedly detect it, and would probably eat no more. The curry was exactly the medium which would disguise this taste. Our first suspect, Fitzroy Simpson, could never have caused curry to be served in the trainer's family that night, and it is surely too monstrous a coincidence to suppose that he happened to come along with powdered opium on the very night curry was served up. I therefore eliminated Simpson from the case, and our attention centered upon Straker and his wife, the only two people who could have chosen curry mutton for supper that night. The opium was added after the dish was set aside for the stable boy. But the others had the same supper with uh, no ill effects. So, someone had access to the dish without the maid seeing. And what of the silent dog? Someone had been into the stable and taken out the horse, and the dog had not uttered a single bark. Obviously, the midnight visitor was someone whom the dog knew. I was already convinced, or almost convinced, that John Straker went down to the stables in the dead of night and took out Silver Blaze. For what purpose? For a dishonest one, obviously. Or why should he drug his own stable boy? Mm, why, indeed. And yet, I was at a loss to know. Perhaps to bet against his master's own horse? What was the most in his case? I hoped that the contents of his pockets might help me form a conclusion, and they did. You cannot have forgotten the singular knife which was found in the dead man's hand. It was, as Dr. Watson told us, a form of knife which is used for the most delicate operation known in surgery. It was used for a delicate operation that night. You must know, Colonel Ross, that it is possible to make a slight nick upon the tendons of a horse's ham and to do it subcutaneously so as to leave absolutely no trace. A horse so treated would develop a slight lameness which would be put down to a strain in exercise or a touch of rheumatism, but never to foul play. Philip! 
Scoundrel! We have here the explanation of why John Straker wished to take the horse out of Tumbo. So spirited a creature would have certainly roused the soundest of sleepers when it felt the prick of the knife. Well, I've been blind. Of course, that was why he needed the candle and struck the match. Mm -hmm. Undoubtedly. But in examining his belongings, I was fortunate enough to discover not only the method of the crime, but even its motives. As a man of the world, Colonel, you know that men do not carry other people's bills about in their pockets. <laughs> Most of us have quite enough to do to settle our own. Oh. I at once concluded that Straker was leading a double life. He had a mistress. The bill showed that this lady had very expensive tastes. Liberal as you are with your servants, one hardly expects that they can buy 20 guinea walking dresses for their women. Good heavens. I questioned Mrs. Straker as to the dress without her knowing it. She clearly had never seen it. From that time, all was plain. Straker had led the horse to a hollow way. His light would be invisible. Simpson, in his flight, had dropped his cravat, and Straker had uh, picked it up with uh, some idea, perhaps, that he might uh, use it in securing the horse's leg. Once in the hollow, he got behind the horse. Easy, boy. Easy. Soon be over. Steady, steady. Just need a little light. Ah! You see? The horse killed the trainer in self-defense. Wonderful. You might have been there. My final shot was, I confess, a very long one. It struck me that so astute a man of Straker could not undertake this delicate tendon licking without a little practice. What could he practice on? My eyes fell upon the sheep. It transpired that some had gone mysteriously lame. My surmise was correct. You've made it all perfectly clear, Mr. Holmes. When I returned to London, I called upon the milliner, who had once recognized Straker from his photograph as an excellent customer of the name of Derbyshire, who had a very dashing wife with a strong partiality for expensive dresses. I have no doubt that this woman had plunged him head over ears in debt, and so led him into this miserable plot. You've explained all but one thing. Where was the horse? Ah. It bolted. And was cared for by one of your neighbors. So we must have an amnesty in that direction. Ah, uh, we are at Clapham Junction. We shall be in Victoria in less than ten minutes. If you care to smoke a cigar in our rooms, Colonel, I shall be happy to give you any other details which might interest you. And that concludes this presentation of Arthur Conan Doyle's Silver Blades, adapted for radio by Tim Crook and Richard Shannon with violin music performed by Robert Gibbs and Michiku Ueno. I'm Steve Zakar. Support for this program is provided by National Public Radio member stations and the NPR Arts and Performance Fund. This is NPR, National Public Radio.